Hi there. Have you ever wanted to be an invisible man who has giant teeth, summons horses, and uses time and chaos magics? Well, now you can. You just have to make a, a roguelike. Or play this one, I guess, but it doesn't have a name and it's not available anywhere at all. So say you want to make a roguelike, uh, like a card game, but something out of paper, a game at home, um, but you don't know where to start exactly. Well, it's simple enough. All you really need is some paper and willpower and a pencil. You don't need any of these fancy custom-made art card stuff. Those can be helpful and nice, but really all you need to get started is some good old paper. So, first thing you're going to want to do is you're probably going to want some sort of standard-ish shaped and sized cards. You want to go ahead and fold up a piece of paper. I like folding it into nice eights. Get some nice even cards. So now that you have this, I like tracing lines here to differentiate your cards. Um, and then now you have these nice eights, which then you can just cut later, and they give you some nice cards. Now, where do you want to go from here? Well, this particular game that I'm making here is a roguelike. For those of you who don't know, you progress through uh, fighting a whole bunch of bosses that I have designed here. Um, and you wish to get as far as you can, and there is final bosses, and you progress through uh, randomly set up zones, so it's different every time you play through. There's a whole bunch of different classes you can play as, uh, including our Invisible Man from before. And you collect treasures and moves in order to uh, power up your character and select him so that you may defeat the bosses. If you ever die, there's permadeath, you go and you can start over, but it's sort of like how far can you get fun type thing, or can you beat it? Um, I'm aiming for this one to not ever be beatable, so how far you can get challenge type things. So there's never, you can always do better. You're gonna wanna start with this, trace them out, and then you're gonna wanna get some basic ideas for your game. I'll show you what I chose for my game. So, here's a, here's a pretty basic guy here. Let's bring him up to the camera. So, the, the basic rule of my game is you start by choosing a character to play as. And this guy is named Slayer. He'll have an amount of health, so if you ever get that down to zero, you die. He's got this little attack symbol, um, which means it, all your attacks deal that much extra damage, and this little intelligence symbol, which is how many moves he can know. Now, in your game, you are going to want some sort of deck or move set that your guy uses, because um, this is like the backbone of your game, decision making, um, it, it needs to be changeable, so which is why you should probably use cards if you're making a roguelike. And these cards are going to have some very specific design things you're going to want to do to them. I will mention that later when I'm going through moves, but there's certain things you definitely do not want to do, otherwise your game will end up very boring. But, let's look into this. You're going to want to give each of your characters some sort of special ability, such as this guy makes weapons more powerful, and you can hold a weapon. And you're going to do something to give him um, a unique starting set. So it can be good to not give them a static starting set of stuff, but I'll instead allow them to build that up themselves. Or you could do a static starting set, but that you need to like play test that a lot to make sure it's a fun and sort of dynamic starting set so it doesn't force the player into any one particular archetype so that they don't have to go that way every time. Um, and I'll get into more of what that means later on. So, this guy can hold four moves, as you can see by his intelligence, so let's get on to, um, you know, what those are and what makes a good move. Design tips. One thing you never want your moves to do is you never want health gain effects, such as this, which gives you health and rewards you for having contraptions, which is a mechanic in my game, to be more efficient than damage moves. Now, this isn't a particular da particularly efficient damage move because it has an extra effect, but if your, if your health gain moves are more efficient at gaining health faster than your damage moves, it becomes very stale in that you can spam health gain moves and the, the game match never ends and one, one person is just kind of hopelessly outmatched by the other person spamming health gain. You want all your moves to not feel like you can just spam them. That is the general rule. Another thing you don't want to do is just have a bunch of moves that just deal damage. So, let's say everybody, these are two moves that sort of just deal damage. Um, not exactly, because I've avoided that. But let's say they both just did four damage and three damage. Um, then it just becomes a race, like how much health do you have? I'm gonna spam a damage move every turn. And just racing like that, and using damage moves that don't use unlimited leaths, they're spammable, and they don't affect the board, or the sort of state of the game in any meaningful decision-based way, um, are not good. So you want to try to avoid those types of moves in your game. So, what do you want to have? You want to have moves that effectively 
change the, the way the game is played by both players in at least a small way. Such as this, this shining armor will give you health and then an extra health for each contraption you have. And contraptions have health and they sit and play. So they, normally your enemy might think, I don't need to target your contraptions, they're not very dangerous. When you play this card, they begin, they have a higher priority because now, if you can destroy them, you lose getting the extra health. And stuff like Hidden Strike, it deals two damage and has a chance of dealing an extra damage. Let's say you had this, it deals two damage and it dealt two extra damage, your opponent has a three damage move. This move sort of does more damage than that move half the time. On average, it deals the same amount, but you don't want to race them with this move. You don't want to just start spamming your damage move because you could lose. And it's if you lose once against the enemies, it's not good. So it just disencourages any sort of racing effect from the player, uh, making them make more interesting decisions. Um, another way to get around this is a sort of move that you can, like this one. Um, you, it, it buffs itself throughout the course of the game, but it doesn't start out particularly efficient. So, uh, you can try to raise somebody, but you won't have, you're forced to play a slower sort of build, which might affect, you don't want to play all the most aggressive cards, which differentiates builds, and maybe you want to use a different move at the start of the game in order to take out some sort of problematic contraption that the opponent has. Um, you have cards like Deflect, which gains you health back up to three health if you took that much damage last turn. So stuff like this means that it is important for your opponent to pace their move if they see you have a deflect. So they can hit you with a weak move, and then if you use it, you, they bay out and hit you with their strong move, so they don't get the minimum health gain from it, because it's, it's sort of efficient at that. And you can also have moves like Throwing Knives, which has three uses per battle, which means that you can't spam it, really. It just has three uses, so you have to be, think about and use this in a wise way. Um, you have some health gain effects like Heroic Act, which makes you permanently discard it when you give health. Um, ignore this bottom part for now. Um, you have to think about when you use this, because you don't have it anymore, so you can't just gain 7 health outright. Um, you have cards like Purify, which if anybody gained attack, then you use this and all the attack buffs that last this battle go away. Um, you have Axe Slash, which punishes people for gaining health. Tiring Strike, which is very efficient, except you lose attack this battle, you get minus one. So you start dealing less and less damage, and then you become, so you can't deal damage. And then you have stuff like Trusty Steed, which puts out a contraption that your opponent would want to prioritize, unless they're being hyper aggressive. There's all sorts of things that sort of change the way the game is played. Another important thing is you don't want people to have entirely static move sets if they just have a set of moves that they can use once per turn, which is the system my game uses. Therefore, the idea is that when you're in, say, the kingdom, all the kingdom moves that aren't being used are shuffled together into a deck, and every turn they're placed down and one's flipped up. For one turn cycle, the players can use this, and then next turn cycle, a different move is available, a different move is available, a different move is available, and these might be situationally good against the particular boss you're fighting, or they might be situationally good against you, and so you might want to use them. Additionally, additionally, um, in further zones beyond the kingdom, there's some sort of small benefit to um, playing the deck card, because on average, a random card from the deck is just very, very bad, so it's not much of a decision you're making, it's just like, I don't want to use that bad card. However, in the future zones, there's a small buff to it, and that incentivizes people to use that card, um, and makes it more useful and gameplay interesting. Nessus. Now, bosses, it's very difficult to make them interesting if your opponent can see the card. So, if they if they look at the card, oh, I know everything about this boss, it becomes inter disinterested. So, I like to, I'm sort of, when I play this game, I'm a permanent sort of a dungeon master. So I play as all the bosses, and somebody else gets to uh, see the cards, um, you know, play with their cards, and they don't get to see the bosses, because I get to, I deal with all of that. So, keeping them secret is a big plus. However, for this video, I'm just going to show you this, because you want to see it. Um, it's Sword Napper Goblin. It's got health, it's got some moves and stuff um, that it'll start out with, so it can build itself up. Um, you have its abilities over here, which allow him to, he has low health, but can mess with the player's moves and their ability to deal damage, emphasizing the deck move, which he also punishes. So it sort of, uh, it punishes somebody with a low amount of options to win the game, um, in that particular way. You want your bosses to punish a specific thing, or have a particular gimmick or play pattern that they do, so that it pressures the player in a unique way. Just having generic bosses will never lead to a fun play experience. Additionally, we have this. This is the kicker. Uh, it has a little bit of a flavor text that I will read them, which may or may not have something to do with this, the secret. Now, the secret 
is important. It's a very, it makes things fun because the player doesn't know what it is. They don't know what it does. They don't know if it's good or bad. They don't know anything about it. And it's something that's in the boss fight that they will have to try to get and it could give them great power. For this one, you have to hit him because he likes shinies is the hint. Um, and if you hit him with a treasure move to kill him, then he wants your shiny treasure move, which normally it's hard to do because he tries to take your moves away at the start of the battle. So it's probably try power target your powerful treasure moves. If he kills it, he wants to take it from you. And then it offers an interesting choice to the player because do they want to give it to this goblin? What is the goblin going to do? In this case, he'll give you a powerful treasure, the loot sack, um, in exchange for that. However, the player doesn't know that. It could be something like a different boss that exists within the kingdom, which is the Skeleton Knight. His treasure, or his, his special secret, is actually a bad thing, and so they don't know if they want to trust the goblin or not if they've experienced this before. So he hits you every turn and knocks a move out, or knocks a card, at, knocks a card whenever he damages you, and you'll lose it for two turns. However, when you discard a treasure, um, he says he once had honor and seeks to regain his lost weapon. This is sort of flavor blurb. So if you drop a treasure, he takes it, you lose it permanently, and he runs off with it. You win the battle, but it's sort of like, oh, well, I, I wanted that. So it's, it's a negative effect. Um, so maybe poking around in the dark for secrets isn't always a good thing, unless you know what you're doing and you think you know what the secret is. So it always offers a way for the player to interact with the world in a new and meaningful way. It's always interesting. And then one last design decision I want to include in this video is your treasure design. So these are all the tr starting treasures that you can start with. And some of them are like static effects, which are generally pretty easy to design. And some of them are moves. Now, treasure moves are a very interesting type of thing to look at. Let's put out a few here. The thing about treasure moves is that they're, they're moves, so you use them, um, but you can't have them be hyper-efficient damage moves. That just doesn't fly, because in the effect, in the sort of moveset you're building, highly efficient um, move is a treasure, then you have it in your moveset, and there's no reason to use your other moves. You just spam the highly efficient damage move, which isn't very interesting, but it's a good strategy because, like, it just wins you the game. So. Well, how, how do we solve this sort of issue? How you do that is you make none of the treasure moves uh, efficient damage moves without some sort of chaotic drawback. Like this gear bag. It's powerful, but it says one use for battle, which means you don't really want to spam it, and you draw two gear to use this battle, which is another type of card. Um, that's... No, I'm not going to get into it here. This makes you draw two random moves to use this battle with plus two or three moves, plus two attack, and you can only use it once per battle. This deals damage because of the number of times it's been used in a battle, so it can be very good, but you have to, you know, build around it. Um, you do spam that one, but it, it's not just racing somebody. They have the, they see the inevitable coming, and they have to find some sort of way to stop that effect. Uh, and this one uh, refreshes the move, which means it gets rid of it. Um, it, it's fatigue, which is also an important thing I'll get to here in a minute. So they all do uh, have different powerful effects, but none of them are just direct damage efficiently always. So that's important. And last of all, last of all, we have fatigue. So the thing about these moves is you, um, if you look at them, um, you don't want the player to be able to just use the same move every turn. That's not interesting if they just know the most efficient thing to do. They don't want to build strategies, and then it's it's not good. So you always want to include two things with the moves. First thing you want to include is fatigue. It's a mechanic in the game. When you use a move, you can't use it again this turn, and you can't use it for one more turn. It's in fatigue, meaning that the player has to vary up which moves they use, which encourages combo building in their deck, in their sort of a move set gathering, and. As they defeat bosses, they can lose moves and they build up combos. And then from that, they are encouraged then just to use the other moves because they work well together. So you don't have switching back and forth between two moves. You actually have a move you want to go and you know alternate between and choose between, which makes meaningful choices in gameplay, which is what we're going for. And the other thing you want to do with moves is you don't want them to be overly restrictive in an archetype and do nothing outside that archetype such as Shining Armor, let's say, and Protect. They normally have an effect that gives, is very effective based on contraptions. And as you can see, however, they both don't do nothing if you have no contraptions, which helps them if they're the deck move, you don't want, to, and they do nothing 
for your architect, it's very unfun. If they do a little bit, there might be a reason to use them. They both will just give something, either you or anything of your choice, plus one health if you don't have any contraptions. So they don't do nothing, right? It's important. And then the other thing is it also allows you to pick up cards that are outside your archetype. Say you want to move to the archetype where you can play lots of contraptions. But you don't want to pick up all the contraption cards because they, if they didn't have this sort of uh, generic effect, they are really, really bad. So you'd never pick them up. And so you have to stay in your current archetype. You're sort of, maybe you're just dealing damage kind of efficiently at the moment, which won't win later on because it's just, it has a very um, saw, uh, specific damage sort of power cap to it. So what you're gonna wanna do is, you know, if you just have these effects, you can pick up this card. It makes you a little bit weaker, but if you can push through, it doesn't do nothing. And you can start picking up more cards and you can start building a more powerful sort of build. Um, and that's important. That allows players to have mobility and make meaningful choices in gameplay. And choices in gameplay, and not just doing the same thing, is very important to making the game more fun. This is popular. Um, we'll be looking into one of the other zones I've made, um, and the sort of decision making behind how and why you make a specific zone a certain way. Maybe we'll look at the arena. Um, and because you make you want to make zones differently and there's different lessons to be learned about the different archetypes so like the kingdom is a generic uh, variety zone however the arena is actually a politics seeming zone so it sort of simulates other players in the game and they have rules um, on how they how they operate and then you can manipulate those rules and sort of make deals deals with them and the, the whole archetype is different and then there's the aggressive zone where you just deal damage there's a combo zone where you have to set up complicated combos um and so you, it's important to look into those archetypes and realize certain lessons from you so we can go over that if you want if this is any good let me know down in the comments and uh guy who made that comment right there um don't worry that's coming i just wanted to make this video so cool also don't forget to like comment and subscribe